G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got an exciting video because it's that time of year again. Um, we've got a new build of Revit, in this case Revit 2022. Now I'll be honest, last year Revit 2021 didn't really um, reach out to me that much in terms of updates and interest. Like there were some good new features, but everyone got way too excited about sloped walls, I felt. Um, there were a lot of great quality of life improvements, but they didn't necessarily get all the uh, attention I think they deserve. But I must say that Revit 2022 actually has quite a lot of really relevant updates. Um, some are particularly exciting, um, so I will focus on those first. But the aim of this video is really to share with you the updates that I think are of most interest to both BIM managers and also architects as well. There are some features that I won't be diving into in this video, um, in particular some related to interoperability or IFC uh, certification level. In this case, Revit 2022 um, has focused on achieving IFC 4 certification. That doesn't necessarily mean you can just hit export and get a good IFC, um, but there are a few more features in the background they have developed um, in response to the open letter that uh, surfaced uh, last year. As well as this, there's also some things like being able to link in Rhino.3DM models. Uh, but again, I won't be focusing too much on this, all the engineering features that have come about um, in this version. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, um, I guess we'll jump straight in. I'll obviously be using Revit 2022 and just showing you some of the features um, in an actual sample project so you can see how you can take advantage of them um, as soon as you have your hands on Revit 2022. Um, it's also worth noting that I will uh, be doing a separate video on Dynamo because there's a lot of great new nodes in Dynamo that I think are worth being aware of and a couple of API methods as well that we can really use to uh, enhance our automation workflows. Anyway, let's dive in. So in this case, I'm gonna be exploring the new features just using a sample model, which you can download on my website for free, just a remake of the basic sample project. Um, but let's just jump straight into, first of all, my favorite features or the things to me that are the highlight that might be a really good reason why you might wanna use Revit 2022. Uh, sooner rather than later. The best thing in my opinion in this release is the revisioning update. So in this case, if you go to view revisions, um, you're gonna notice there's a pretty big change here called customized numbering. It's really exciting. So essentially this allows you not only to have alphanumeric and numeric, but you can add different revisioning systems on top of these ones that are already here by default. A really common complaint with the revisioning system in Revit is it couldn't achieve the ISA requirements which require you to have different types of revisions like P revisions and C revisions to manage different phases of the project. So if I go to create a new revision type, I can give it a name. For example, maybe this is a preliminary revision. I'm gonna keep it a numeric um, in this case and I'm gonna give it a prefix of P0 dot. And I could also do P and just make the O0 separate because sometimes you might want to set a system where the revision number is actually on the very end for work in progress revisions in the ISO system, or maybe you wanna just use a standard uh, P0, P1, and P2 system. So let's in this case, actually, maybe we'll just say the prefix is P, and um, in this case, we have uh, two uh, minimum numbers of digits, and we start at one. So in this case, if we make this a uh, numeric preliminary system, if I go to add a couple of revisions, in this case, if I change them from numeric, I can now use my preliminary system instead. And check it out, we now have the ability to dictate custom revisioning systems independently of the actual systems we had before. And we can either go per project or per sheet. Obviously, if we go per sheet, it's all gonna be dependent on which revisions you put on which sheets. Um, but otherwise, it's definitely possible in order to achieve an ISO system. So I really have to commend the development team for this new feature. Um, I think it's one of the highlights for sure. Um, another really nice quality of life feature is if you go to a 3D view now, uh, whilst we can see 3D levels, um, we've been able to see them, I think, for two versions now. We can also come over here to this Show Grids tool in the Visibility Graphic Settings. In this case, if I go to Edit, I can pick levels that I want to show grids at. So if I just turn on, say, maybe my ground floor level, check it out. We now have 3D grids, which essentially act like planes in 3D. So that might be a really handy little feature when you're navigating a large project in 3D on a project. And I believe you can also show these in axonometric views as well, if you wish. Um, so a great feature there, um, really nice surprise that one. A really great feature for documentation and managing wall types is a feature where we can now hide non-core wall layers. Really interesting feature. So in this case, if I place down a wall and I'm just gonna place a concrete wall with a plasterboard stud. So in the type properties under structure, 
I've added um, two layers outside the stud layer. I'm not the stud layer, the concrete layer. So in this case, you can see I've got a concrete wall with a substrated wall um, on it as well. Now, often we might do something like a concrete profile setup plan, and we want to hide off those compound, compound layers. Um, the only way we could do this before is parts. And most people know that parts is a pretty stinky system to work with. Um, it's good for what it tries to do, but it's way too complex to manage on large projects. So at the moment, I've just got two wall layers here um, together. But if I go into my visibility graphic settings, down to walls, um, we now have a new subcategory, in this case called non-core layers. Now, whilst we can't override this, unfortunately, we can just turn it off. So if I OK that, now I'm just seeing that layer of my concrete wall. So I think this is a really interesting tool, and it's probably going to change how a lot of firms potentially manage their compound wall types. There are still some limitations. For example, you can't set separate um, off offsets either side of the wall. You can only have one variable offset, um, which I'll have a video on about at a later date. Um, if you do want to change the height of, say, that stud wall compared to the concrete wall in between. So there are some limitations still. But I've got to say, it's definitely a welcome feature um, that a lot of people have been asking for for a long time now. So my fourth favorite feature, um, whilst I may not necessarily find a great deal of use for it, is um, tapered walls. So it's an interesting addition. So previously in Revit 2021, we gained the ability to do uh, slanted walls. I must say I haven't used a single slanted wall in Revit since it came out. Um, so it's not that exciting for me, but the industry seemed to lose their mind over it at the time. So I've got a wall here. And as you probably know, in Revit 2021, you can set it to a slanted wall with a degree. Um, we can also do these as curved walls as well. So if I model this as an arc, we could also do this as a slanted wall as well. Now, one feature that's been added is if you do have a slanted wall that's a single plane, you can actually edit the profile to the plane of the wall now. So I can go and draw and edit that profile. It will be cut um, horizontally as well at the plane of of the cut, um, but it will be drawn upon the face of the wall in how it's set out. Um, having said that, you can't do it on a double curved surface at the moment. I'm not sure if you ever will be able to uh, because of the way that work planes function in Revit. But one feature that we do have now is the ability to taper walls. So if I just uh, create a new wall and instead of slanting it, I'm just going to keep it as vertical. One thing you will have to do before you taper a wall is go into its type properties go to its structure and set its um, the layers that you wish to taper as variable. A little bit how, how like you might do a floor with a modifier subpoint when you want the base to remain constant. So in this case, it's the same thing, uh, but instead in the context of a wall. So now if I set this wall to be tapered, um, either side, I can essentially uh, override the type properties, but I can also set a type based taper as well. And I can set two different angles, say eight degrees and five degrees. And I can splay the base of that wall outwards. Um, so that's going to be an interesting feature for people maybe trying to do some, some rough earthwork cuts or also for um, rammed earth walls. I think there's definitely some use uh, for this tool, uh, but I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use it for personally, um, but I'm dead sure there's definitely some use for it. Um, so between slanted and tapering, uh, we really mostly have a, a lot of flexibility that we need on the wall tool now, um, which other platforms used to sort of use against Revit as an argument. Um, so some other interesting things we have now are some new model categories. So if I go to visibility graphics, um, let's just have a look. First of all, we have audio visual devices, which is a handy category for elements that we used to classify typically as special equipment or generic models, which really did more so belong to um, things like TVs, phones, things that don't really seem to belong to either of those categories. Um, you could say they're electrical equipment, but often engineers use these for things that they're modeling instead. Um, so I think that's a good category. Um, there is a, some weird ones too, like food services equipment. I guess it's for retail and serveries. Um, I guess it could be useful. Um, so, but I'm, I'm sort of surprised they didn't just sort of treat that as specialty equipment. Um, we also have hardscape, which some landscape architects using Revit uh, may find useful when they're doing some model in place. Uh, then we also have uh, medical equipment, which I know a lot of hospital uh, based projects are really going to like because it means you have the ability to manage the, the graphics and you could change um, all your medical equipment just using a filter. Um, obviously, we all have big libraries that we've already developed um, quite thoroughly that would contain a lot of these elements categorized as specialty equipment. So I don't know how long it's going to take for firms to switch over to new categories, or maybe they just won't. Um, but it's good to know that they're there.
As well as this, a really welcome category is signage. Um, so usually in projects when we model building signage, uh, we often would use something like generic models and apply a filter or, a, or an object style to all the signage in order to switch it off. Uh, but having a dedicated category for this really common element that we usually want to hide in most views, I think is really welcome. And finally, we also have um, a category in this case, um, I don't know if temporary structures was there before, um, but in this case, we also have a great new category <clears throat> called vertical circulation, um, which is going to be perfect for things like escalators, moving walks and, and lifts um, when we didn't really have a category they belong to before. So these categories should better help us at least internally manage the graphics and visibility and categorization of our model. It'll be interesting to see if any of these um, export to an IFC category properly or if these are going to be things where we can do custom mapping ourselves because some of the default categories um, were quite restrictive in what you could actually export them as when generating an IFC. So as well as this, um, a really welcome change that I really like is we have a few new API features that we can access. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, these are things we can use in Dynamo or applications in order to automate workflows. So I'm just gonna open up Dynamo Player in this case. And the, probably my two favorite API changes are that we can now make floors with holes in them and we can also make ceilings. Uh, these two things weren't possible before. So what I'm gonna do is just create some model lines I'm just gonna go and draw four lines and I might just go to my inputs for my script. And I'll make a separate video about this to show you the, how the Python methods work um, in order to access this new API method. Um, but in this case, we're just gonna generate a floor with a hole and also a ceiling above that with a hole as well. It's pretty crazy that we couldn't do this before, uh, but it's great that we can now. So hopefully, hopefully Dynamo Player uh, opens up sometime soon. I think probably I'm holding the attention of Revit maybe. There we go. So now I'm firstly just gonna collect some border curves. And then I'm also gonna create a donut in the middle. And I'm just gonna select those. I'm just gonna pick a level and I'm just gonna run this script. And it's when and generated a floor uh, with a hole in the middle as part of its sketch. And likewise, it's generated a ceiling. So we didn't actually used to be able to generate ceilings at all. Um, it was a really missing portion of automation in creating elements by room or by curve. So these are two really welcome additions to the API. In addition, we now have better control over the positioning of view titles and wall prof profiles and various opening profiles as well. Um, so really welcome changes there. Um, as well as this, um, I've been informed that the road category uh, can be used properly now as well, whereas apparently originally it couldn't be used properly in elements. Um, now, probably the last major feature that I really like is the ability to batch export PDFs with naming rules. Um, this is something a lot of custom applications have been doing in the past for us, but Autodesk has actually built in uh, a native tool that can do this now. So if I go to File, Export, uh, PDF, I can now go and export a drawing set based on some setups. Um, and in this case, I can just say where I wanna save it as well such as in the set folder, you can use the sheet size or you can nominate one yourself. Um, but one really great option is you can build a naming rule. So just like a lot of the custom applications that do this, such as XREV and ProSheets, um, this tool can essentially do that as well. You can source uh, various parameters in this case. I mean, obviously they took heavy inspiration from these tools. I'm not sure if the developers of these tools are gonna be very happy that, <laughs> you know, their, 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 um, their ideas have necessarily been chucked in Revit for free. Um, but I must say it's very welcome for people that have been looking for this built into Revit for a while. So once I export, um, it's gonna go, in this case, some of them may not always have the PDF parameter requires requirements that you need, um, depending on how you've named your, your values. But in this case, it's gonna go and export them all individually to a single folder. So I think that's, um, that's quite an exciting feature. Um, and off it goes and everything's gonna be printed exactly as, as, I, as I need it to be. And there we go. So um, I think they're my highlight features, um, but I'll now sort of focus on some, some other smaller aspects of features that I think are quite interesting as well. So some of the quality of life improvements relate to scheduling. Um, there's a lot of things that we've been wanting in schedules for a long time that have been added in this version. The first thing I'll show you is just putting a schedule across more than one sheet. So if I go and take a schedule and I split the schedule into two parts, we'll notice if I grab this other part, it's no longer related 
to the schedule I broke it out from. So that's already quite interesting. And the great thing about this is what it's done is it's created a schedule one of two and two of two. And what I can do now is I can just take that two of two and I can move it to this sheet and I can go back to the original sheet and just get rid of the, the uh, one of two. And now I have a schedule that will essentially uh, receive um, changes, I believe, from the previous one. So if I go back to, to this schedule and change the length and I go to check out schedules two of two, we can see those schedules are still connected. So this is really handy for a project where you have a massive schedule, something like say a door schedule, um, which might need to span across multiple sheets. Originally, we used to use really awkward filtering methods in order to create this system, or we separated them by level and just hoped that they didn't leak off onto the next sheet and that we never ended up with more doors than a sheet could handle. So I think this is a really welcome improvement um, to the way schedules work on sheets. Um, one really fantastic feature I've been waiting for for a long time, which has been added, is the ability to add uh, shared parameters to key schedules. So if I go in this case to my finishes keys for my rooms, um, and if you don't know what key schedules are, definitely go and check out my video on them. They're fantastic and you should be using them. Um, but in this case, we didn't used to be able to add um, non uh, out of the box parameters or non project parameters to them. So in this case, if I go to my fields, well, now I have access to all my, my values as shared parameters as well, which is really exciting. So this means we can do things like add properties uh, based on IFC classes. So we might be able to find some shortcuts there in managing the values of some parameters of elements. As well as that, it's just going to give us a lot more flexibility in how we can use key schedules to lock down our values. So if you're not aware of how they work, um, for example, all my rooms have got keys associated to them. And at the moment, if I go and find my finish key, which I believe is here, um, you can see that if I pick a different key, all the properties will update to match the values that that row in my schedule contains. So it's a really good way to lock in uh, finish schemes or properties of rooms. I know engineers use them a lot to manage load classifications and having shared parameters pretty much perfects this system and means that we can use it a lot more than we used to. As well as this, uh, multi-category schedules have had a lot of improvements. So if I go to schedules and quantities and I make a multi-category schedule, um, everything's looking the same until now and then, whoa, like it looks pretty different. Uh, first of all, we have a parameter name searcher because obviously when you're dealing with uh, multi-category schedules, you have a lot of things to filter for. So if I search for say, authoring, I can limit my parameters to just a few if I know what I'm looking for, as well as this, I can look just for dimension parameters. So that's a really handy feature, but what's really exciting here is if I just add a code and I also add a category to see what categories we're dealing with. And then I go in this case to sort by category, then by code, and I'll make a header by category with a blank line and I'll just de-itemize so that we're seeing just one code per row. Well, let's have a look at what we're looking at. So not only do we have things like casework and curtain panels, but now we have doors, ceilings, we have system categories like walls, floors. These things didn't used to be able to be captured in a multi-category schedule. So this is a really welcome improvement and it means we can be much more flexible with how we use multi-category schedules. It does mean you might have to change your systems in order to filter more things out, but I think this is a fantastic feature um, that has been much needed and has been really preventing us from taking advantage of what a multi-category schedule can offer. As well as this, um, there are similar improvements to material takeoffs, uh, which will now capture many more categories in the same way. Another feature we didn't used to be able to do in any schedules was to filter by family or type, which can sometimes be really useful if you have various naming conventions for your families and your family types. So if I add these two parameters as options, I can now actually pick them from this list, whereas originally I couldn't do that. So that's definitely a welcome feature as well. There's definitely gonna be things we can do with that. Now, I'm not in a work shared model, but you can also add work sets to schedules as well to see what work sets elements are on. So that's gonna be really great for helping people do audits, especially if they're not that good at using something like Dynamo. Um, so that's some of the improvements that have come to schedules, and we'll keep having a look through um, some other category uh, improvements, especially dealing with tagging. So most of the updates to tagging, I would call mostly quality of life updates and also just minor feature additions, but they're all very handy in more flexibly doc documenting our model. Um, the first thing and probably the biggest feature in my opinion is now we can rotate all types of tags in our model. Um, and as we rotate them, it will flip them back to the default orientation. 
but we can in this case rotate them flip them um, do all sorts of things which is really essential in any project where a part of the building isn't really orientated to project north but you want all your annotations to face that direction quite a common requirement on some projects um, when they're more complex in shape because not every building is a box um, that can just orientate itself to project north entirely so I think that's a really welcome feature and it's been requested for quite a while. So I think it's great they added that. Another interesting feature is if I take this keynote, for example, note we now have this option to add and remove hosts. Um, so if I add a leader in this case, which is attached to this element, if I add or remove another host, notice in this case, I can add more than one leader to a tag. So this is definitely another welcome feature. Um, it is really important to note that whilst I can go free end and you know, make these a little bit further away, they are still associated to both elements at the same time. If I do add something else to the tag, for example, this door, notice now we get a varies, which means that there is more than one value that the tag can show out of all the values there is. Um, in this case, we can go and try to nominate a different value, but it is going to go and push that keynote through to all those elements, I believe. So you do have to be careful. If you want this to say something different, um, you can go to manage additional settings and go down to multiple values indication and you can actually override what this will say like um, error And you can see that you can make it more obvious that in this case It's not really intended to be tagged this way. It might be more obvious to the user um, But if we just take out that other host well, we're back in business again So I think that's a really um, well well um, requested feature over the years as well we can also add revision, uh, uh, sorry, dimension prefixes and suffixes, which is really welcomed. So I can go and just add um, prefixes and suffixes to any dimensions of this style. And we can see now that we're going to be adding those. So this will have a lot of use for different types of dimensions um, that you may need to show a additional prefix or suffix for. And means that we're no longer going to have to go and just replace it with text and lose the intelligence of having an actual live dimension number that we just want to prefix. I know there's definitely some immediate use for that um, for some companies with very specific dimensioning requirements. As well as this, um, we can actually just tag more elements with a multi-category tag. So if I create a railing, we definitely didn't use to be able to tag this with multi-category tags. So if I just go to create a new multi-category tag, I can actually tag this railing now and extract an element from it. There are lots of other categories that weren't previously taggable that now are taggable. Another notable element that is just taggable in general, not just with a multi-category tag, is a curtain wall mullion. So we didn't used to be able to tag mullions. Now we can. I don't know if there's ever really a reason to tag them, but you can anyway. So I can actually isolate the mullion itself as an element um, rather than just the, just the curtain frame overall. So that, that's a pretty welcome change as well. Um, again, just a small thing, but just a nice thing to have. Um, so most of the features from here for me are mostly based on quality of life improvements. So we'll also just have a quick look at those. This last set of features mostly relate to improving just the general experience of using Revit. Um, one that I really appreciate is I went to the manage tab and I went to, I believe, um, project parameters in this case. And we now have the ability to search for various project parameters if I just want to look for a very particular set of parameters, I can isolate them here. And I think that's really handy for large projects where you're gonna need a lot of different types of parameters. Maybe it's even just IFC parameters. You just wanna limit your IFC parameters only, and I can just limit them based on something they have in common. So that was a really nice feature. As well as this, a lot of windows that didn't used to be resizable are now resizable as well. For example, the purge unused dialogue. Um, you'll notice if you've used Revit for a while that straight away, purge unused is a little bit bigger by default, but it does have a resizable uh, down, down to a point it's resizable now, which I think is a really great feature because sometimes what you're purging uh, might be quite deep and quite long and you do need to read that whole thing. Um, so that's really great for model managers in particular. Um, another really interesting feature is filtering by phase. Um, this is something that we couldn't do before. So if I create a wall and I'll just make a concrete wall, my whole model is currently built on new construction. I'm just going to put this on existing, um, but I'm not going to demolish it. Uh, if I go to view filters, I can create a new filter. Um, and let's just say in this case, um, created on existing. I'm going to apply this to walls and I'm going to go and pick uh, my phase created parameter. So this is new. We didn't used to be able to use the phase created or phase demolished parameters. So if I say phase created 
equals and I'll say equals existing I can now go and apply this filter on create on existing and maybe I just want a half tone and now you can see that as well as using phase filters themselves we can actually graphically override elements as well which is really useful when you may want to show everything in the model but you want to show various colors or overrides for elements being affected on different phasing tasks this might also be another way to achieve demolition plans where the rooms are visible i'm not 100 percent sure how this is going to work just yet but i'm pretty sure if you set up a filter to show the elements being demolished uh, by the phase you're currently on you might be able to achieve a demolition plan with the rooms visible um, you won't get some of the behavior of demolished elements for example infilling so in this case it might not quite work but there's definitely some potential for this um, it's really interesting as well that you can say if something's demolished after a certain time in the project as well you don't just have to be explicit so if i go back to my filters i can also use um, greater than and less than so i can say that maybe the phase created is less than new so in this case i can say is it before new construction so if i use less than this implies before if i use greater than this implies after and i can get the same effect but for multiple phases at the same time and this is something that you can't do with phase filters currently once an element's been demolished for the phase the next phase only thinks about the one before it so i think there's definitely potential with this change it's probably a bigger one than i think it is um, i just really haven't had time to play with it yet Another quality of life improvement I actually just stumbled across whilst testing is if I go to filters, I can actually shift select or control select multiple filters now. And I can modify their properties in batch. I know this is going to be great for consultants that use a lot of filters. For example, I know that the guys over at Parallax um, rely on filters really heavily. So I can imagine this is a big one for them. Uh, being able to batch select but I'm sure there's a lot of similar firms out there uh, that use uh, shift selecting or they use a lot of apps to essentially achieve batch changes to filters at the same time for example maybe you just wish to change uh, the line style of all of them so whilst you can keep some on varies you can make back batch properties to some of the properties of these for example so I think that's a great uh, little feature as well um, one, one of the last features I'll show you which I think is really impressive I think it's great is if I create a new floor plan, I'm just going to make a working view. And I create a call out which is dependent on that view. So if I delete this view um, in previous versions of Revit, it would just tell me views have been deleted. Um, and in this case, that would just get rid of all the views. Um, if these views had views, that they would be deleted. So it could be a really destructive thing that happens. Um, one little safety net they've given us now, if I do try to delete this plan, is I'll get a notification telling me that there are views dependent on this view and I can either delete the call out views which was our previous only option or I can make those call out views into new views which I assume also retains dependency so I'll test that if I go to this smaller view and I make another call out inside this particular view I haven't tested if that retains dependency so if I delete the topmost view now there's two dependent views. So in this case, if I make one independent, um, I should just have this as a floor plan. And great, you can see that other dependent views are still available to be dependent upon that original callout view as well. So this is really going to protect a lot of really damaging actions from happening on large documentation sets. Well, this is a really common accidental thing that happens. So there you have it, um, Revit 2022. Um, as you can probably see, my favorite feature was probably the new revisioning system that's been long overdue and is really going to help us achieve the ISO requirements um, and the British National NX uh, numbering and revisioning system. Um, but as well as this, it's something that will help a lot of firms as well. Obviously, a big challenge for a lot of us now is how do we get our projects to this version to take advantage of the features. Um, so just a reminder that you ideally should up upgrade models one version at a time. And the more versions you take your model through, the more risk you run of corruption. Um, so do just keep that in mind when considering which version to use. Um, I hope you found this video useful in finding out some more about the new features in Revit and that you also enjoy using them. And feel free to leave comments down below if there's other features I didn't cover that you think are worth uh, other people being aware of as well. I'm sure there'll be heaps of blog posts and videos you can also look at, which might touch on some of the features that maybe didn't excite me so much, but maybe excited other people as well, such as engineers. And don't forget that I'll have a separate video on all the new nodes and features that we have access to now in Dynamo for Revit 2022 as well. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos.
Thanks. Take care. Bye.